Thanks for coming, everyone. Welcome to the historical combined partnership of the Humboldt County Library, Humboldt County Historical Society, and the Clark Museum to our Saturday speaker series. Every first Saturday of the month, we present a lecture by one of our local authors. And uh, today, we're really happy to have Patty Fleischner, who is the director of the Trinidad Museum. And Patty's lived in Trinidad for 44 years. Is that right? Wow. And she's extensively researched the Spanish voyages of discovery um, here off the North Coast. And she's presented several OLLI classes and holds a master's degree in history. And so today, she's going to be speaking on the Spanish exploration on our North Coast. So welcome, everyone. And uh, Patty, go ahead. Thank you, Susan. Thank you all for coming and to Jay for recording this. And, um, for Alexandra Cox, who shares time with both the Lucky Clark Museum and the Lucky Trinidad Museum. And it was um, Alex who helped with this presentation. Otherwise, you'd just be getting me with my books. <laughs> so um, I became interested in the subject of Spanish navigation because the Spanish really haven't gotten as much credit as they, they should have for navigating the entire Pacific Northwest. Um, under Al, uh, Pope Alexander VI in 1493, after Columbus sailed and, and did, made his discoveries, the Pope, who had tremendous influence and power, the Pope declared that pretty much the Western Hemisphere was to be divided between Spain and Portugal. Hence the voyages to occupy um, South America. And in the papal bull, um, slide next, um, under Carlos III of Spain, who reigned from 1759 to 1788, um, Carlos III of Spain was quite a remarkable man. Um, probably one of the most enlightened of the uh, monarchs of Spain. Carlos was the grandson of Louis XIV of France. So Spain, the Habsburgs, um, had, there, weren't, there weren't sufficient leaders in Spain to, to take over the leadership of Spain. And so Carlos III, who had... Um, actually been the, the governor of Italy, of Sicily and Naples and other places in Italy, was asked to become king of Spain in 1759. And the descendants of Carlos are still the royalty of Spain today. Carlos was interested in um, the intellectual pursuits that were occurring all around Europe at the time in the Enlightenment. And he was interested in music, minerals. He was the founder of the Prado Museum. And um, he took a particular interest in mining, of course, because the South America was rich in natural resources. And he felt that um, he wanted to take seriously Pope Alexander VI, um, papal bull that said the Pacific Northwest is Spain's. Next one, Alex. So there was a very capable viceroy in uh, New Spain at the time, this fellow, Antonio Maria Bucarelli y Ursa. He too, this, the stars were aligning for Spain in this particular period in the late eight, um, 1700s. And Ursa was a, uh, or Bucarelli, was an honest man. He was a good administrator. He sort of took up Carlos III's mantle in, in paying attention to everything. Flora, fauna, science, medicine, minerals, everything. And he wanted to protect the Pacific Northwest against any encroachments from other nations, such as Russia. This fellow, we won't talk about him as much today, he was equally um, insightful and hardworking. But it was Bucarelli, Carlos III, together with Bucarelli, who got the Pacific Northwest voyages started. 
And then when he died in 1779, it was um, Revia Gigido. And I should, next slide, Alex. The, um, I should tell you right now that I studied French in school. I'm very sorry for that. I wish I had become fluent in Spanish because I didn't know I, my master's degree is in British history. <laughs> and uh, from the Tudors to the Stuarts to the Hanoverians in, um, in England. And it, when I was studying all that, I had no idea that I would be living in Trinidad for 44 years and be coming into contact with these amazing uh, Spanish navigators. So uh, the stars aligned for um, Carlos III, Viceroy Bucarelli, who had all the power of the king in New Spain, communications being what they were. And um, in, um, before Quadra, in 17, this is, the, this is the most amazing navigator that I'm going to talk about today. There are lots of them, lots of amazing Spanish sea captains, but Bodega y Quadra stands out. Um, this is, you, you can see this in um, Victoria, British Columbia now. There's a statue in Victoria of him. It's just wonderful. Next slide. And together with um, Bodega and his co-pilot, Franc Francesco Morelli, um, he was a little younger. He was an incredible cartographer. And so, Bucarelli sent in 1774 this man, Juan Perez. He was a um, veteran of the um, Acapulco to Manila and back, the trade that had gone on for a long, long time. And he had had many voyages back and forth from Acapulco to Manila, this man, Juan Perez. In 1774, when Bucarelli was trying to establish a seaport at San Blas, Perez was the only capable mariner to take on a really important voyage. So in 1774, Juan Perez, Voy um, had a voyage up the um, Pacific Northwest coast, but he didn't land and he didn't make any maps. He went on a vessel, the Santiago, that was um, built in San Blas. That was sort of at the end of like Cabo San Lucas, Baja California, and then just to the the east is San Blas, which Bodega thought was a horrible port. It was mosquito ridden and swampy. My surfing friends tell me today it's a gorgeous beach <laughs> and a wonderful place to visit. And um, Longfellow wrote a wonderful poem called The Bells of San Blas, which is very enticing to visit there. But um, our, my favorite navigator, Francis, Juan Francisco de la Bodega y Cuadra thought it was a horrible port. Nevertheless, it was the place where you built ships. And the Santiago was there, built. And uh, Juan Perez took it up the coast, but it was a, um, next slide, Alex. Um, or hold on to Tofino for a minute. It was a, um, it was a, he was a brave, industrious man, but he understandably was frightened, to some, frightened isn't the right word. He was reluctant to land every single day of the 1774 voyage. This is his diary. And, and this is written in sort of sea captain <laughs> um, language where he doesn't make many observations about animals or people. This is a lot of, it was raining today, it was foggy today, it was, we couldn't see a thing. And, and this is the kind of diary he had. And so th going up the Pacific Northwest coast, Perez really could find no place to land. And so he did get up to the Queen Charlotte Islands um, 
about lat above latitude 50 uh, in British Columbia, but he came back and his voyage was kind of a disappointment. The other thing that was hard for him, he was only in the Santiago, a single ship, when Bodega and Morelli and Hazeda and Perez began their voyage in 1775, the next exploratory uh, voyage, they had the S Sonora. So back to, okay, Bodega um, studied with this man, Vincent Tofino. This was Bodega's teacher in Spain. And so he taught him whatever modern instruments were available at the time. Nobody in all these diaries of Bodega and Heseda and all the rest, there's no evidence of actually what instruments, like a chronometer, uh, compass, and azimuth, there's no evidence of what they took with him. However, Bodega learned how to use that, those instruments for navigation to determine latitude and longitude. And so Tofino was an inspiration to Bodega. Next slide, Alex. And um, this man was another one of those bright lights, along with Carlos III, Bucarelli, these amazing navigators here. And this fellow, again, it's just, it's, it's, I sort of equate it with our founding in America and in, in France. There were just, it seemed like some of the best brains <laughs> were at work in the late 1800s. And um, this was one of them. So he was another one um, who encouraged the navigators and he appointed Bodega's coming out of St. Blas. This was after the 1775 voyage. Next, Alex. This fellow, okay, this fellow I have in here because he plays a role in the Perez voyage. Remember uh, the uh, Perez voyage in 1774 went from San Blas up and around everything, up and around everything. He did not land. However, he almost landed at Nootka Sound in uh, the northwest part of Vancouver Island. And um, Jose Martinez, Est Est Esteban Jose Martinez, was his co-pilot in that voyage. And this is, this is important. It seems trivial, but it's not, because it affected the whole Spanish um, settlement, possession, rights of um, occupation until 1795, actually. So in this voyage, even though they didn't land, Perez and this fellow got as close to Nootka Sound as they could. They intended to land. It was just too rough. The waters were too rough. And, but the Indians came out, uh, the Indians who lived in um, Nootka came out, and they were friendly, <laughs> and they traded back and forth. The, some of the Indians came on board their ship. And it's not known whether these silver spoons these Spanish silver spoons were traded, whether they were stolen by the Indians, whether they were left behind, nobody knows that. But this is really important. It's just one of those mystical <laughs> facts that you, um, in history, that are just random. When Captain Cook, the Englishman, remember we're, we're working with the uh, Spanish here looking for maybe Russian encroachments. Weren't thinking about the English at that moment all, the, uh, but the English got word of all these voyages later. <clears throat> so James Cook in 1778, he was up in Nootka and um, one of the, the Indians was wearing a necklace of these silver spoons of the Spanish. This little bitty random act, they didn't land, they didn't establish their cross, take possession, have their formal possession ceremony, but the fact that Juan Perez and this fellow 
were there. And it was you know, proven that the Spanish had been there before the English. This came up later, and this may be another talk because I'm not gonna go into 1792, but it's a fascinating <laughs> period as well. Anyway, next, that's enough on uh, Martinez. Okay, so we're, <laughs> we're, this is the world. This is the, the North Coast. In 1544, nothing is known about the North Coast. Next. And here we are in 1575, terra incognita. You can recognize South America. Spanish had been there for a while. But look at our Humboldt Bay, <laughs> Trinidad. We, this is 1575. So the English, now, and, and there had been some Spanish voyages. There had been um, um, Cortez. Cabrillo, and then in 1595, there was uh, Cermeño, he was a Portuguese navigator on a Spanish ship, and then in 1603, there was uh, Vizcaño, who sort of made the first map of Monterey, but Sir Francis Drake, in 1579, landed somewhere, we still don't know where, we'll probably never know where, maybe it was Drake's Bay, Bodega Bay, could have been Trinidad. It, there's a recent theory that it was in Oregon. So Sir Francis Drake from England in 1579 sort of claimed California as New Albion. The English were here. Well, so go on, Alex. Um, so here's, again, look at, look at where we are. I mean, this wasn't that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> and there's still nothing known about the North Coast. Keep going. Okay. <coughs> now, this is, this is advancing a little, <laughs> but um, Sir Francis Drake, you know, made his claim, but then he, and he made, the Spanish were worried because, of course, he, he pillaged a lot of Spanish ships and was not a popular man. Elizabeth the first of England approved of him, but he kept no diaries, no journals like these fellows did because um, his mission was secret. And the Spanish really kind of ignored California. They didn't have the manpower. They didn't have, they didn't have the resources to explore. So finally, um, the, it, was, it was not the English that the, the Spanish were worried about particularly, but it was the Russians. And in um, 1741 was the, you know, the Bering Straits. It was the Danish fellow, Bering, who perished in 1741, um, made maps that the Russians were paying attention to. And they, they did start to go into that um, Alaska you know, the Aleutians and so on. And the Spanish got wind of this, hence all these journeys. So this is um, a way of showing you, this is a wonderful map. It's similar to that, but not quite. This was a map um, compiled in 1791-92 by Bodega and Morelli and um, it, between 1774, the Perez expedition, and 1792, when that map was made, it's not that long. And this tremendous amount of exploration should, you know, had, had gone on. This is just quite remarkable. This map is shown in this wonderful book. Um, Voyage of the Sonora. This is Morelli's journal. But the interesting, one of the interesting things about the Spanish voyage is that they, they were very secretive. They didn't want their movements known. Um, they wanted, in, you know, it, we don't know why. It, in, 
in our age, in America, and later in England, you want to share, the French too, but you want to share information. You want the world to know these amazing scientific geographical accomplishments. You want to know these things. But the Spanish didn't get the word out. And so um, I suppose they were worried, well, if we show the world what we have here, then everybody's going to come. It's, just, it's hard to know. It's the, the Spanish um, were secretive. The English were, too, to some extent. but but not the way the Spanish were. And, and back to what I said at the very beginning, I think it's the reason why the Spanish don't get credit for this, because by 1792, it's a wonderful story, and it's one of the reasons I found this subject so interesting. There's a map of, um, this is Bodega's work by 1792. Remember, I'm still back at 1775 in Trinidad. But by 1792, finally, there was cooperation between the uh, English navigator, George Vancouver, and Juan Francisco de la Bodega y Quadra, where they put their maps. This is uh, Bodega's map. And the next one, Alex, I hope it's, yes, OK. <laughs> Oh, good. Success. So this is Vancouver's map. And Vancouver and Bodega became friends in 1792, trying to settle a possession, occupation, sovereignty question in Nootka to the, on the northwest of Vancouver Island. It's just, it's an absolutely fascinating story, which I'll the, maybe a fun. I'm invited again, we'll do that lecture. Just, just going to Nootka alone is wonderful. But again, I find this so fascinating because finally there was cooperation. So these two amazing, um, Vancouver didn't speak um, Spanish, Bodega didn't speak English, but they, they had translators with them. Together, they put these two maps together and if you, um, you had a better copy than this, you could make your way up to Alaska today with these maps. So between 1774 and 1792, it's just an extraordinary accomplishment when you go back to those first maps we looked at. Next, Alex. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, this, so this is an example of um, where they wanted to explore for, um, from the Russians. Here, this shows the Bering voyage. And um, they had some information about this, but not enough. The main, the main map um, Bodega and Morelli and Eseda and Perez were relying on was a French map by a guy named, a Frenchman named Bellin, B-E-L-L-I-N. And he had some of this Alaska Aleutian Islands um, geography right, but it was, it was worthless, really. They were on their own. Next, Alex. And so here is, are the voyages of these amazing people, Perez, um, Heseda, Bodega y Quadra, and Cook, the Englishman, in this period that, where everything opened up for them. And this is, um, I wish we had a portrait. I, if I spoke Spanish, I'd... I need a translator to go to Madrid. Most of the information about all of this is in uh, Mexico and Madrid. So we don't have a pig. That's a Spanish flag. That's a Seda. <laughs> so he I read his diaries. Amazing navigator. So when they started out, Seda was a Spaniard. Bodega was a Spaniard a Spaniard, sort of, but he was born in Peru. So when they started out on this voyage in 1775 that Bucarelli sent them on, um, Heseda and Bodega were equal in rank, but, um, and it's a little bit of snobbery, the um, Heseda, Bruno Heseda became captain of the Santiago and Bodega y Quadra became captain of the little 30, 
it, uh, there are various accounts here. It's 36 to 38 foot schooner, the Sonora, where it was 12, and, 12 to 12 and a half feet wide, 36 to 38 feet long, and there were 16 men on board. No, no women passengers in those days. Um, and you could not stand up. You could not stand up below deck. And so when they set out, this is a comment that in, um, this is the diary of Morelli, this fellow, the, probably the best cartographer in the bunch. But he said, um, so this is when they first set out for San Blas. Oh, I should explain. So they started out from San Blas, remember the New Spain capital, or not capital, where they built the ships. That was their headquarters. In March 1775, after this voyage of discovery, they got back to Monterey in October. Um, and so March to October, it's there on a 36, 38 foot vessel with wind, rain, fog, mist, drenched constantly. So just, this is just like the first few days out in Morelli's diary. He says, um, um, let's see. To say the truth, we could not but be sorry to observe the horror that the crew conceived of the bad condition of the schooner. They were being towed, by the way, at this stage by the Santiago, which afforded miserable quarters for the sick as the seamen could not do the business without being thoroughly wet, except when it was calm. These distresses would have become insufferable had not the commander, Bodega, behaved with the greatest kindness to the crew. He encouraged them to persist also by giving them frequently small presents and reminded them of the glory they would obtain to their return if, if they reached the proper latitude, which was suggested in Bucarelli's in, um, instructions to be 60. They wanted to reach 60 latitude. Trinidad is 41, well, very, I think it's 41, Four, but it's in the Spanish things, it's 41, six or seven, which is pretty close. <laughs> um, he, he added also that the risk was nearly equal to both vessels, the Santiago and the Sonora together, and that as each ship's company valued their lives, they might be sure that it would not be attempted to proceed further than was consistent with their mutual safety. This interposition of the commander had at length the proper effect, and we all agreed to live or die together. <laughs> so this is just in the first days of the voyage. These guys, the crew, who <clears throat> were some of the, a few of them had sea experience, but many of them were, you know, Mexican ranch hands or. Indians from Mexico, not real experienced voyagers. So um, they went on and, um, okay, next, Alex. So this was the, um, ah, we can skip this one because this will be in the next lecture. <laughs> okay. This show, this is confusing, but it gives you an idea of 1774 and the Perez voyage is the one that went way out. And Heseda and Bodega in 1775 stayed much closer. And here, their first landing was at Trinidad. And um, then these are later. They're, oh my goodness, I'm probably not going to have time for that. This is really interesting. I'm, I'm going to stop here for a personal note, actually. This is kind of out of context, but it is kind of interesting. Um, personal life of these guys. Bodega wanted to marry his loved one in um, about 1778, 79. In order to marry in Spain, you have to get 
the permission of the Bazan, the earlier picture of Bazan, the naval commander, he wouldn't give it. And so um, Bodega, I think it, it's kind of vague. It was sort of blessed by a, a priest. These, these men were very, very devout Catholics. All of them were. Um, and there was on board all the ships, there was at least one or two um, priests you know, to, to do the formal possession ceremonies, which we had in Trinidad and other places. And so they're very, and the Indians were fascinated that whenever they saw the Spanish seamen in their devotions, they always knelt. They made these altars, and when they had possession ceremonies, there weren't very many, Trinidad was one, they would kneel and pray, very formal in the instructions, these are fascinating. I'd like to read you the whole thing, and I don't think we'll have time, but another time, these are the instructions from Bucarelli. And in his instructions, this is the Viceroy of New Spain, he has the formal possession ceremony all laid out, the way they're supposed to behave when they take possession of the ports. Um, so this is, this is off track, but it it gives you an idea of the poignancy of these men's lives who are out there to see their whole lives. Anyway, Bodega, um, with the um, approval maybe isn't the right word, he had a common law wife, finally, and then he had a son, his heir, who was, shared his name in um, 1790, he had a son, and, uh, didn't see much of his father. Bodega um, died at age 49, almost 50. He would, 1744 to 1794 were his dates, but he, he died at age 49, just shy of his birthday. Anyway, he did marry. The, the other reason I brought this up is this fellow, 1779 voyage, this was like the third voyage um, up to the, the upper limits, see we're getting more map here, we're getting more information. This man, a very able seaman, was put in jail because he um, wanted to marry, this was in Spain, and Bazan and Carlos would approve of his marriage. And instead of just calming down and doing what Bodega bit was, which is to live with this woman and keep it quiet, Ortega um, erupted and was disrespectful to his superiors. He was actually thrown in jail. And then later he was released and went, this was before this voyage in 1779. But um, it's just a little, a teeny little glimpse into the um, personal lives of these these men, they're just human beings and their, their bravery <laughs> and their tenacity to go on these voyages when they knew nothing is just incredible. So yeah, that's, this is the, an example of all these voyages and how we're finding out more and more. The, um, let's see, Bodega only made it up to only. <laughs> their mission from the instructions of Bucarelli, the viceroy, was to get to 60 to 65 latitude. That was their mission. Those were in their instructions, and presumably because that's where they, the Russians were, and in fact, they were there, but they, the Spanish didn't encounter them. So um, in this voyage, the 1775 voyage, when Trinidad was discovered, <laughs> um, they, uh, they kept going after Trinidad, and they were in Trinidad, they were there for 10 days. June 9, 1775, they landed, and on um, June 11, 1775, they did the formal uh, ceremony. Now, this isn't the uh, original cross we have, 
parts of the original cross, complements of the Clark Museum <laughs> at Trinidad Museum now. And this is a little commercial for Alex. Alex Cox works with the Clark and Trinidad Museum. So we have little bits of the original Spanish cross. And Alex, when she was working on her graduate studies through now Cal Poly, then HSU, um, authenticated the cross that we have at the Trinidad Museum. So this one, it's, it, from the maps, it looks like it's kind of the same place. This was this, um, the Spanish cross that, the, um, Span that was used in the claiming ceremony, very, very formal uh, claiming ceremony in Latin done by Father Campa, C-A-M-P-A, -A, in Trinidad. Um, they, they erected the cross, and then when George Vancouver, you know, the amazing Englishman that I was describing that worked with Bodega later in 1792, um, when he went into Trinidad in 1793, so this is 18 years later, the cross was still there. So the Yurok Indians, you know, who lived in the village were respectful of it and, and uh, didn't mind it being there. And then, so eventually the cross deteriorated. We just have the bits of it in Trinidad Museum. The ladies clubs of Humboldt County erected this granite cross. It was made in Renning, and this is 1913. And this was kind of a big, big deal, but it's the same language, um, a, you know, a tribute to Carlos III. And I'm going to skip, okay, this is about that business with the spoons I was telling you about. <laughs> so let's go on to the next one, Alex. Yeah, that, okay, that was, let's skip these two. This is gonna, I don't have enough time for all this. Okay, here's the Gloria Santiago. And um, so this was the lead ship with Bruno Heseda as captain and the little Sonora, the little 38-foot one. This is, has some of the uh, diagrams of the, the ship. And there is, a di there is a model of this in the Historical Society, Oregon Historical Society in Portland, Oregon. It's, it's really fun to see. Yeah, Arlene would want to go see that. <laughs> um, so back to, we're going to back up to Juan Perez in 1774. Juan Perez, one of the reasons, too, he didn't go close to the shore was he didn't have a small vessel. This is a giant frigate, and it can't go near the shore. So they were, um, they were astute enough to send the Sonora, which you know, could do the ins and outs of the coast. And so after that first voyage of Perez on the Santiago, they had a second vessel. Yeah, next one, Alex. Yeah, so this again, it shows um, just how far he went out and then how he, this was the place up here. Here's the Nootka in um, northwest Vancouver Island, which, by the way, at the time they thought was attached to the mainland. It wasn't until 1792 that um, some, the Spaniards, Valdez and Galeano, and George Vancouver, in a cooperative move by 1792, they circumnavigated Vancouver Island. And this was the first time that it was shown that this was not part of the mainland. It, it was Charlotte? an island. Vancouver yeah, Queen Oh, sorry. Yeah, thank you, Deborah. I can't see very well. Yes, here's Vancouver Island, shown as an island. I'm sorry, thank you. Um, yeah, so Nick goes up here. And yeah, Valdez and Galeano and Vancouver went all the way around this. And um, Vancouver's ship, the Discovery, uh, careened, and it was the, the Spanish who helped them uh, get the vessel back to working order once they got around to Nootka again. A very cooperative 
very, very happy time, the 1792 period. It was, um, it, was a, it was a good time in world history when there was cooperation between the English and the um, Robert Gray, the um, so-called discoverer of the Columbia River was up there. He and Bodega got along so well that Robert Gray, the American fur trader, named um, his child after Juan Francisco, he named. So this, yeah, we should, we should go on, because there's, I don't want to get into the 1792 part. I'm hoping I can come back and do that part. So go ahead, Alex. Yeah, so yeah, this shows better where they were at Nitka. And so this was the spoon incident when the Indian canoes came out to greet them and either were given, bartered, stole the spoons. We'll probably never know. But it was a big deal for the um, sovereignty of Spain, Spain. And of course, we know the outcome eventually. It was Great Britain won, but, but the negotiations between George Vancouver, sea captain and diplomat, and Juan Francisco de la Bodega y Cuadra, mariner, diplomat, in 13 letters they wrote between each other. It was all courteous and civilized, and for a brief period of time, you know, there was no, no war <laughs> between England and Spain. At this time, things sort of blew up later. Um, so go on, Alex. Oh, this is a, this is a, isn't Trinidad, but this is an example of the very formal ceremony that whenever they took possession of um, a port, this is, this is how it looked. And, and many times the Native Americans joined in, you know, in the, in the mass. But part of Bucarelli's instructions were, it, it's, this is two pages <laughs> of his instructions on how to perform the mass. And uh, so that was important. Go on, Alex. Okay, so here, yeah, here's our, in the Trinidad Museum, here's our little cross, and here's the replacement one. Go ahead, Alex. Next one. Okay, so they're in Trinidad. Um, June 9th through 19th, 1775. Harmonious, um, harmonious relations between the Spanish navigators and the Indians. It was everything we wish we could have today <laughs> around the world. The Spanish landed, and as far as we know, um, they were the first Europeans to come into Trinidad Bay. Canoes of Indians came out and with sign language traded immediately with you know beads, um, they weren't very interested in cloth. They traded um, dried fish. Um, ultimately, the, after 10 days, the Indian, and they liked the um, biscuits, the Spanish biscuits. And they were very gracious about allowing the Spanish to take on wood and water, which they were desperate for. And um, so, in the end, the, um, let's see, they were there for 10 days and they were asked by the chief to stay. This is Bodega's journal in the Four Ages of Churai. This is a wonderful book. Um, many times, this is Bodega, many times, translated, remember. The, my only sources are English translation of original documents. So even though everything I read is original documents, it's translated. So there, I know that, but I trust some of these translators. <laughs> um, many times the Indians asked help of the Spanish to defeat their enemies in the field. There is certain evidence of their wars with other neighboring towns, although they were friendly with several Indian visitors who soon arrived at the beaches. 
So um, they apparently number more than 300 of all sexes and ages divided into groups with doubtless formed separate societies. So the Churai village in Trinidad is sort of below the, the bluff where the, the town where the Memorial Lighthouse used to be, that was the central Churai village with Yurok people who still, the descendants still live there. And there, but there were little villages all up and down the coast, of course, and on up to Klamath. So it doesn't make mention of who was having an altercation with whom. But um, through all the Spanish voyages, the, um, without exception, without exception, all the places they stopped along the coast the, the Native Americans were very, very interested in their knives and their cooking pots and anything made of iron. Their, um, they coveted the water barrels, you know, the metal that held the water barrels together. The, the, the most popular trade item was iron because, of course, the Yurox were using elk and stone and so on for their implements. And um, in Trinidad, there were uh, one or two of the um, villagers, the Churai village, had a, uh, like an iron knife. And now remember, this is sign language. They can't communicate except by sign language, but they'd point, you know, like, where did you get this? And um, they pointed to the north. And then in some of the writing here, um, there's speculation that one, the iron may have gotten to the village prior to this first landing in 1775, might have gotten there because of um, a shipwreck previously that you know didn't actually land, or that there was trade that some of this, for instance, this is a guess that maybe some, the Yurok Indians in the Klamath area had um, there was a shipwreck there and they did a lot of walking and trading and so on. So maybe they got the iron that way. And then one of the villagers um, pointed to the beach and you know, indicated that he found it there, from, possibly from some shipwreck. But they loved the beads, they, that was a, and, and other trinkets that the Spanish bought, and they had cases of them, again, in Bucarelli's instructions. Um, it's like they brought, oh, I, I don't, it was cases, cases and cases and cases, probably on the Santiago, of, um, of beads and trade goods, you know, to, and they, they had some metal too. I don't think, there's not much evidence that they gave them weapons, but there was some metal materials that they could give them. But that was the thing that they wanted the most. Anyway, it was the, the Churai village people were very generous with their wood and water. The Spanish mariners mentioned that there were like four to six springs. We have Par Parker Creek and there's another one coming down on what we call Old Home Beach or Indian Beach now. Um, but in, in those days, it was just rushing springs everywhere. And in all the accounts, in, um, so Perez writes a journal Heseda writes a journal, Bodega writes a journal, Father Camper writes a journal. <laughs> they all mention the crystal clear water. And then here's another thing that I really haven't mentioned yet, but it's pretty important and you're probably all aware of it. I love this when toward the end, so 10 days, June 9th through 19th. And on the last day or two, where's, here we go. Here, you know, Little River, that's sort of the boundary of of um, uh, Moonstone Beach area. And then, so the Yurok country then, and still is sort of roughly the Klamath River area down to the Little River, that's sort of roughly the Yurok area. So Little River, probably Weot would be south of um, the Little River. Anyway, they went up the Little River a little bit. Um, has, uh, Bodega didn't go, but Morelli and Heseda did. And they named the little river Rio de los Tortolas, River of the Turtle Doves, because they saw what could have been morning doves or pigeons even, but they were flying, and so River of the Turtle Doves. 
And the river of the turtle, the um, turtle doves could have been a Northwest Passage. So besides wanting to save souls and, and uh, keep Catholicism alive in California, where you know, we have the San Diego mission in um, 1769, not, and, and all these mariners knew Father Sarah, the originator of the Spanish mission in San Diego in 1769. So saving souls was very important. Looking out for Russian encroachments was important. Looking at all the, the topography, the um, plants, the, the flora, the fauna, uh, everything, the Bucarelli's instructions were learn about the Pacific Northwest. And one of the principal interests, of course, was trying to find the Northwest Passage. Um, which by 1790 didn't, uh, well, I mean, actually Thomas Jefferson and Lewis and Clark were still looking for it in what, 1804. That's what they were looking for from the opposite direction. But the Spanish wanted to find it um, going east. And so every waterway, like the Rogue River, the Klamath, and I, I said, you know, and Heseda didn't go up as far as um, Bodega and Morelli did. He stopped roughly at the Vancouver Island area and then turned back because all of his men, almost all of the men had scurvy. And, but on the way back, Heseda saw the Columbia River. And this was in 1775, but he didn't, nobody told anybody <laughs> it should be the Heseda River. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, really, he, he discovered the Columbia River, as far as we know. Um, Heseda saw the Columbia River as a potential Northwest Passage. And there was a, a belief among all the Spanish mariners that perhaps uh, the Juan de Fuca Straits, you know, south of Vancouver Island, that's one of the reasons they were very interested in that Vancouver Island area, because they thought Juan de Fuca Strait maybe go straight east. Um, well, it didn't. but. That was part of their exploratory mission. Anyway, I love it that Little River, <laughs> Rio de los Tortolas, I, nothing is said about the Eel River, but a Rio de los Tortolas was a potential um, Northwest Passage, as was the Klamath, as was the Rogue River, as was the Columbia, and um, that, you know, that, was, that was important to them to try to find, and nobody did, but that, there were just a number you know, of missions um, that the Spanish had. And I wanted just to show you the euphonious nature of Bodega's writing. Let's see. That's the remain part. Oh, this is funny. This isn't about the fauna, I wanted to tell what Bodega said about the fauna because it's really interesting. But um, this is uh, his remarks on the trading. The natives receive be beads with appreciation and tobacco pleases them greatly for they cultivate it in small plots near their houses and smoke it in tubes similar to the mouthpiece of a trumpet. We have a number of those in the museum. You guys probably do too here at the Clark. Um, they do not enjoy our food and drink so much. Although they took it out of politeness, they threw it away <laughs> when we were not looking. One of them became so familiar with the Spaniards that for several days he dressed in the clothes of his sailor friends. And to better accustom himself to the foreign ways, he often sat down at the table in the presence of his countrymen. And um, what the Indians, Eight. Now, this is the Spanish translation. Um, they hunt deer, and he says buffalo, and almost certainly that elk is what he means. Bear, seal, and sea otter. Um, although the pursuit of the last two might be classed as fishing, they have never seen evidence of any other animals, nor were there any others discovered on these shores. Well, that's, they, they did see other you know, birds. Um, I wanted to, oh, goody. I found it. So this is Bodega, and it's just poetic. Um, so Bodega is ruminating on if Trinidad 
Remember, 1769 is the first Spanish mission, and then they're up by Monterey, and then 18, by 1823, they're up in Sonoma, right? So 21 missions were established, and uh, Trinidad could have been another one. Never was, they never came back. But they're, you know, they're looking at all this land with an eye to what, can, what could we do here if anything was ever settled, which is a, a far off um, dream. <laughs> the land asks only to be cultivated to produce in abundance the same fruits, more or less, as the countries of Europe. Its mountains are covered with tall pines, meaning redwoods, which form a thick forest centuries old. Its residue continually improves the soil, which supports fragrant green growth. It enchants the senses for the mixture of rose, wild marjoram, lily, plantain, celery, thistle, chamomile, and an infinite number of other plants that would be precious finds for a botanist are produced with that inconsistent disorder with which nature knows how to divert the eyes of the observer and forms the most pleasing and agreeable garden imaginable. So this is a Spanish mariner, <laughs> <He's> a poet, <laughs> I think. Um, so all Oh my goodness, where do we end? Keep going, I guess, Alex, oh goodness. Um, oh, this just shows the latitudes and so on for the part in Trinidad. Go ahead, Alex. Um, yeah, this shows their, their stops along the coast. There was a claiming one in, in Bucareli Bay up here by Sitka. There was another claiming ceremony um, that Bodega made. Go on. Okay. Yeah, this is for another time. Rats, okay, go on. <laughs> oh, this is a good one. This is a really good one. So. Remember Tofino, the um, scientist where Bodega learned his skills and the other voyagers as well. So when they got to back to Monterey, he's taking the voyages of, um, well, I mentioned Arriaga and, of course, Heseda and, and Bodega and Eliza and um, Martinez, Perez. He's taking a number of voyages from between 1774 and, and 1792, and he's tracking them. I mean, this is in, even in, in the book here, when you, with a magnifying glass, this is pretty hard to follow. But it gives you an idea of the tenacity and um, the skill of these amazingly brave men that opened up the Pacific Northwest in a way that had never been done before in 1775. Go ahead, Alex. Um, oh, and this shows, yeah. So this is San Blas, the port where they built some of the ships and it shows their tonnage. This, is, this was another Bodega ship. Here's the Santiago. Go ahead. Um, yeah, we can skip this one too, I guess. Oh, this is good. This shows um, Monterey. Um, so it doesn't look, I don't know, the, I've been to the, oh, I took my grandson to the Carmel Mission. Oh, we saw the cell where Father Junipero Cerro died. It's like eight by 10 with a, I don't, maybe it didn't have a dirt floor. It's this little bed and a cross on the wall and this little table, and that's where Father Sarah died. Father Sarah knew all these navigators and vice versa. Um, but when, you know, Monterey then was sort of the capital of California for a long time, discovered by the, that navigator Vis, Viscaino, if you know Spanish, you can correct me, it's okay, in 1603 is when that bay was discovered. And then this was the, this is where everybody came and went um, before they went back down to San Blas. Go ahead, Alex. Yeah, it's another. 
oh, this is fun. So this is another 1786, Father Perus. He's supposed to be, ch this must be Perus. He's a chubby fella. He, he perished at sea. He's a Frenchman. And he was another one um, who gave intelligence about uh, possible Russian interference along the Pacific Northwest coast. Go ahead. OK, oh, and this is sort of the end. Um, so Carlos III, one of our more enlightened monarchs of the period, died in 1788. In addition to that, we had our own American Revolution, where the French and the Spanish engaged with the English, involving our country, all this going on our West Coast and a lot going on in the East Coast. Um, the French Revolution is going to start in 1789. Our Constitution is being written in 1787. The Napoleonic Wars are coming. <laughs> um, there was a reason why nobody came back to Trinidad and nobody fought for Vancouver Island and British Columbia later on. The Spanish did not have the resources, the manpower, the will. The Mexicans and the Spanish did not like coming up here at all. It was too cold, it was too wet, too foggy. The idea of settling in, northern, in the Pacific Northwest was anathema to these people then. There just weren't enough Spanish people or even Mexicans interested in the North Coast. But remember back up to King Carlos III, this amazing alignment of incredible minds with Carlos, Bucarelli, these incredible sea captains, Bazan, Tofino. We, it was just a golden age of intellect and uh, discovery in the late 1700s. So when Carlos III died in 1788, this is Charles IV, his son, great big family. He was a nice man, apparently, <laughs> a good man, a, a fine family man, and lots of kids. Um, but with, um, well, Louis XVI was beheaded in 1793. The, the tumult in Europe was just, uh, we, we couldn't deal with the Pacific Northwest anymore. And so the interest to, to the most part, I mean, there's a lot to be said about that wonderful year of 1792, which we'll address some other time. But with Carlos IV taking the reign of Spain, <laughs> the reigns of Spain uh, in tow, um, this period of the Pacific Northwest with the Spanish in it was, was coming to an end. And I guess we better stop. I'm sorry, but. <laughs> Thank you. OK. Any, anybody dying to know anything? <laughs> Just curious, when, when were the Russians here? Before the Spanish or after the Spanish? Not, not here. No, the Russians didn't. Fort Ross, you're thinking yeah. of. Yeah. Fort Ross wasn't until 1814. Oh, okay. Okay. And then, yeah. And interestingly, so they were at Fort Ross, 1814 to 1840. And they were st the Russians were still considered a threat, although it's interesting that the Fort Ross was occupied by Indians and Alaskans and Russians. It was kind of an international community. And the Spanish were still not very happy with um, with the Russians being there. But it turned out when the 1823 Spanish mission at Sonoma was being built, and they didn't have enough um, carpenters and workmen to finish the Sonoma mission in 1823, the Fort Ross bunch came over to help them. So another little vignette about cooperation. Yeah, so they, not the, they weren't in the Pacific Northwest in our direction, but they way up in, in Unalaska, you know, Sitka. Yes, I may make a comment. 
maybe some of you know, Russians discover Humboldt Bay. <laughs> I have a map that shows that. It's a Russian map. It was an American captain on the Russian <laughs> ship. I don't remember the date. It's been a while since I've looked at it. Do you but... know about the O'Kanan? Uh, if you know a trip. It may be. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. Because they stopped in, yeah. they stopped here. The original map is in the New York City Library. I New York's. Oh. Well, it, suppose did they implant some kind of plaques in the yeah, bay they, that we've they, never found? They, I don't think they did that sort of stuff. They didn't do like the Spanish, and the French did some of that sort of thing too. But I don't think the Russians did. I don't, I'd have to go back and look. It's been a long time since I checked that stuff yeah, out. The only one I can think of is that 1806. Yeah, uh, but they, though they that's. Wanted, they, I think it was before that. Okay, so there was another one. Yeah, oh. I'll, I'll double check. Well, thank yeah, you. I'm going to give the know. map. Would love to know. What's your name? Mark Wilson. Mark Wilson. Would love to know more. Yeah. yeah. Anyone you. else? Yeah, okay, so when um, when they put the erect of the cross in Trinidad, um, wasn't really at their first interest to claim the area because you said that they wanted to learn about, you know, where they went. But wasn't their first interest to really claim the area? Yes. And it totally surprises me that um, that the um, Native Americans, that they didn't see them more of a threat. I mean, they must have looked completely alien, and I don't get it. I mean, that I just They're, say that. But. Well, they, they weren't afraid. Um, and I think it's because the Spanish were really... Making Bucarelli's instructions were treat everybody well, treat everybody nicely, be kind, don't rock the boat with any indigenous people. And there's a story where that didn't work so well up at Fort at Grenville in Washington, but they the um, Chirai village people didn't feel threatened because the Spanish weren't threatening them. And they, you know, they were only there for ten days, so maybe things could have changed if they'd stayed longer but as it was they were thrilled to see the Spanish and the Spanish responded with that hospitality and mutual hospitality and kind and then they left the cross up if they'd and other places where they claimed the Indians took them down other spots they took them down the Churai village Indians left it up there they um, and they revered the Spanish there all the diaries point out the fact that the Indians wanted him to stay. <laughs> it was, I know it sounds bizarre for today, but it was kind of a wonderful little golden period that we can have hope for, that we can maybe go do this again. <laughs> yeah, but they, in that particular instance, other, other landings weren't quite as successful, but Trinidad was very unique. And the, you know, the, the Indians weren't threatened. They, I mean, they're comfortable. They have a, a beautiful home. They have all the food they want to eat. They have water. They don't need anything. I mean, they coveted the, the metal. That's what they wanted more than anything. But um, there wasn't competition to kill each other <laughs> over something. <laughs> Anyone else? I had a quick comment. Can you put that last slide up on the screen? Does that have the picture of the... Carlos the fourth? Yeah. That one? Just, just something I learned fairly recently, but why, why aren't any of these people smiling? They're all <laughs> rich people. If you're rich, <laughs> you'd think you'd be happy. Why aren't there, does anybody know why they're not smiling? Why smiling? Get your wife picture smiling? taken. Everybody says, "Cheese." Why smiling? Look at her face. She's smiling. Well, Ooh. they're sitting and standing for a portrait, and the well, artist is yeah, wearing them out. Be, that could be. <laughs> well, they could have toothaches. You didn't have dentists back then. Well, he's, he's very, very close. What? They could have toothaches. They don't yeah. have dentists. Oh, back. their teeth are bad. Their teeth were all rotten. Oh, like our poor George Washington. So why were they rotten? Because they're point. rotten rich. Yeah. And <laughs> back in those days, uh, they bought chocolate back. And only the wealthy could have chocolate because it was so expensive. And so Marie Antoinette and all <laughs> those, those folks, you don't see portraits of people smiling because their teeth are rotten. <laughs> so 
I mean, yeah, it's some truth to that. Yeah, no, it is true. Yeah, it's true. I think if you don't yeah. brush your teeth, you're going to have rotten teeth for the uh, Well, sugar that now. could be. Yeah. <laughs> all, the, all the sugar and the chocolate, I mean, it was a new product from the age of exploration. And uh, it was consumed by the wealthy because they could afford it at the time. Hmm. And so, yeah, all their teeth are rotten. So you get, you get the prize. All right. Well, the Romans didn't smile either. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Anyone else? Um, one more real quick question. Yep. Um, the original cross, how, how late in time was it still standing? And then was it just like slowly disintegrating? Yeah, the or? fur trade, okay, so George Vancouver, it was 1775 when it was planted. 1793 when the Englishman George Vancouver came into Trinidad Bay only for three days, he saw it up on Trinidad Head. This is when it was clear, <laughs> clearer. And then in 1817, one of the fur traders saw it. So 1817, it was still there. And then I imagine it was just, you know, slowly deteriorated after that. Uh, nobody took it down because actually the remnant that we have at the Trinidad Museum, it was found by um, the Trinidad Head Lighthouse was built in 1871, and the, the Coast Guard crew was um, making a road to go up to the top, and the pieces of the cross were found by this crew. So that's, that's how we, and then Alex got it authenticated with the iron, the nails, the iron nails. Actually, in, you know, thinking about it, it's interesting that those nails, that the Indians didn't take it down just to get the nails, because there's, there's nails in the cross, yeah. Well, thank you very much, folks, and we'll go on to 1792 sometime if you're interested. <laughs>